We welcome all of you tonight. Those of you on live stream, this is a fellowship of believers. Some of us see each other face to face, and but there's a spirit that is among us all, whether here or by live stream. It is a very precious spirit indeed. Amen. This will be our 19th installment in the book of Amos. We'll be in the third chapter, concluding this chapter tonight. It's obvious from this text, this book, that Israel had stirred up the anger of the Lord. Now, early in uh, Israel's history, God and Moses informed Israel of the kind of God was the kind of God God is, and why He conducts Himself the way He does, particularly in this matter of anger. Here are His words in His valedictory address. The last words he spoke to Israel, Deuteronomy 6.15. God is a jealous God. And then he warned them the, about the anger, anger of the Lord, that it be not kindled against you. Now I will tell you that there are a few people in the Christian community that have even been told this, let alone that believe it. This is how God is. God is jealous. If you take something that belongs to him, like your heart, your mind, your affection, your money, and you give it to somebody else, you will anger him. But if you conduct yourself properly, you will please him. Amen. See, we don't want to leave that out. Amen. When Achan sinned, one man, one man. When Achan sinned, the scriptures say, Joshua 7, 1, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. <laughs> Not not against Canaan, against the children of Israel. Is it possible that one person among us could make God angry with all of us? Well, there's an example right there. When Solomon conducted his life as though God were not the true God, the scriptures say, 1 Kings 11, 19, 1 Kings 11, 9, the Lord was angry with Solomon. The psalmist said that Israel provoked him to anger. God revealed through Isaiah that he has, quote, fierce anger. And that there is such a thing as the indignation of anger, of his anger. Jeremiah declared it was the anger of the Lord that cast Israel from his presence. Nahum challenged the people with these words, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. See, this is all things about God that have largely been hidden from the people of our day. Kindred words to, uh, well, you remember when Jesus one time in a synagogue, he's in a church service. And because of the people were inattentive and belligerent, it says he looked round about upon them with anger, greed for the hardness of their heart. <laughs> this was at a, a gathering, religious gathering. Kindred words with anger, a wrath, or there's uh, indignation, or there's provocation. These are words that tell you that this is how God is. God is just not a soft touch. I think people get this idea from what's being preached. 
There is a time in which God can be hostile towards his people. And he'll do it quicker than he is toward the other people. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians, do we provoke do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Remember, his name's jealousy, which has to do with anger. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? I mean, you, you, you think you can survive a confrontation like that? Well, some people do. Now, so that men don't theorize about this, God demonstrated in the nation of Israel his anger. Okay? Just so you don't theorize about it. He fleshed it out in the people. I still stand in appreciation of what Israel went through. What it took to get the tree planted. Hmm? Write our text in the last three verses of the third chapter, Amos 3, 13 through 15. Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon them, I will also visit the altars of Bethel. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house. And the houses of ivory shall perish, and the, the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Like when it comes. It's not going to be partial. It's not going to be a little bitty illustration or demonstration. Well, quite a text. Hear ye. <clears throat> now the version say, hear this, or give your ear now, or listen, or hear, O ye. Here's the Septuagint. Hear, O ye priests. New Living Translation says, now listen to this. Living Bible says, listen to this announcement. Now, even though most commentators disagree with this these words are directed to Amos Septuagint version says it's directed to the priests hmm? that's what the Septuagint version says pulpit commentary agrees with that and says yes it's the priests he's talking to John Gill says it's a call to the priests and the prophets to hear John Calvin understands that this word was added by Amos just to let the people know that they couldn't trust their priests and prophets. Well, that should be sufficient. Albert Barnes applies it to Amos, applies it to Israel itself. And Adam Clark agrees that it came to Amos. Now, I'm saying it came to Amos. This is God's word to Amos because the prophets and the priests had already proved themselves unfaithful and they're Amen. dishonorable vessels, and God's not going to give this message to them to deliver to the people. So that I consider to be an absurd position no matter who took it. I really think some of them are just copying from somebody that said before. So you hear this, Amos. I'm calling upon you to do this. He doesn't tell a prophet to tell somebody else to do it. He's going to do it. And you hear now, listen up, catch what I'm saying. Don't be leaving, not understanding what I said. That's what he's talking about. Know what I mean. I don't want you leaving Amos and saying I don't know what he meant. This is too hard to understand. You hear, because you're going to testify. And you can't be talking about something you don't know anything about. So listen, and then you're going to testify. That's the purpose for hearing. The word is that the hearer might testify and declare the word to people. God doesn't personally deliver the word to just people individually. He gives it to a representative of his, and he sounds the word out. Amen. So these people say, well, God will reveal this to you. God do it. There's a sense in which that's true, as if you're paying attention to the word. <coughs> when it comes to declaring, God shows it to a declarer. Yes, amen. This is the same kind of word that God delivered to Ezekiel, and it's the same spirit, actually, that was there. Here's what he said in, to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 2, 6, and 7. Thou son of man, be not afraid of them. 
neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. <laughs> now, if you've ever been a preacher, you know what that means. You talk about people. Scorpions, all the time snapping, trying to bite you. Be not afraid of their words. Be not dismayed at their looks. Though they be rebellious house, and thou shalt speak thy, my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. So even if they say, we don't want to hear them, say them anyway. Amen. If you're a preacher, you're watching this, and the congregation doesn't like what you say when you speak for God, shout it out louder. Amen. Make them hear it. The rebels need to hear what God has said, whether they like it or not. If they don't like it, let them go home. Goodbye, good riddance. When the leaders and the people are in a state of spiritual decline, they are in no state to, they are in a state that an issue from God has got to be, a warning from God has to be issued. They're in that kind of state. It's a responsibility on the, on the man to, to say, it, say it, not to make them get That's it or right. understand it. Say it. Just say it. it. It's like God is saying, and I'll take it from there. Yeah, <laughs> Such people that don't, decl don't declare this, they're dishonorable vessels. And dishonorable vessels are unsuitable for divine use, as is taught in 2 Timothy 2.20. Yes? Considering you were saying that, that whenever you have a minister that will speak the truth, no matter what, there will be people that will yeah. be offended and leave, but you'll mm -hmm. also find true believers who yeah. maybe you didn't know were among those people. Now, here, here, that's exactly right. Now, here's something else that needs to be established. That when you have a person who knows the Word of God and can expound it, he himself is not subject to anybody to control what he says. Yeah. I thank God that I knew this. I never did, I never did from a young preacher submit to somebody else to tell me what to preach. I just didn't do it. But I was raised up, see. I was raised up to know this. You are not, you are not, when you preach the word of God and you speak the word of God, you are not subject to somebody else to control how and when you say it. Amen. This is just institutionalism and Amen. preachers just need to refuse to submit to it. Now, I want you to testify in, that's just a key thing here, in the house of Jacob. That's the house of Israel, what are you talking about? When Israel is wayward, he often refers to them as Jacob. If they're really wayward, he calls them Ephraim. Yeah. <laughs> that's the script, that's the way it is. House of Jacob. Some versions say against the house of Jacob. I like testify in the house of Jacob. Amos was not to go to a mountain and testify, and the people had to come to him. No. That's what John the Baptist did. That wasn't what Amos was to do. He was to go in the house. This is in house, in house prophecy. John the Baptist, he was outside prophecy. Preparing the way of the Lord, he was calling the people out, see. Jesus, when he came, he went inside the temple. Amen. He went in the house. Spent time in the temple, in the synagogue. I'll give you all the texts there, some of them. In the house. He was in the house, see. Went in the house. There's a word that had to be delivered to the house. The temple had to hear, people went to the temple, had to hear something. People in the synagogue had to hear something from God. So they went in there and he told them, well, well what they were to hear. This is the man of the prophets. They testified among the people. They were charged with informing the people of their status and of God's view of them. I know people don't want to hear that, but that didn't make any difference, not the prophets. It's why I say, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of their words. Don't be afraid of their looks. They'll give you the look. They'll give you the look. I thank God for being delivered now from the burden of the countenance. 
Oh, yeah, I preached at congregations the burden of the countenance, and I had to look at someone's a kindred spirit or else I'd, I'd get upset. I'd look at some of these harebrains, theological harebrains of doctrinal idiots. That's what they were. They were supposed leaders. I'd have to look at somebody else. I'd look at them. That would embolden me and make them happy. And I could get said what I wanted. Think, but the, you don't have to face the burden of the countenance. It's a tremendous deliverance. Because that, uh, well, that's why God said, don't be afraid of their looks. There's a similar requirement in our day when the messengers of God do have a word to deliver concerning the world and their manners. They deliver it like John the Baptist did to Herod. You know, it's not lawful. Just publicly come right out and told the head of the government. It's not lawful for you to be married to that woman. Come out and told them. See, that's the way Jesus said, you, you go tell, you talk about Herod, he said, go tell that fox. I'll give you my itinerary, what I'm going to be doing. See if you can stop it, fox. Oh, yeah. So there's a place for that. No mistake about it. There's words that had to be delivered to the nation, to the country, but that's that's not the kind of word Amos says. Kill, you know. But see that some of these looks, you know, yeah. I, I've experienced some of to some degree, not to the degree that, mo that some others have. But that you you get the impression from the way they're looking at you that if it were possible, oh, yeah. they would definitely either either one they would stifle you, or or an another way they can do it is just trying to minimize your. Oh work. yeah, yeah. The, the law protects you in this case. Some of them would do a lot further than that if they could. But the law protects us. You know, there's certain laws that protect us. Thank the Lord for them. There's some countries they don't. You notice, I'm sure you notice that in our day, in the apostolic doctrine and teaching of Jesus, it's almost exclusively to God's people. John the Baptist came. That's who he, that's who he spoke to the Jews and any proselytes that was, were among them. Jesus, that's who he spoke to, and then he proselytes. The apostles, all their writings were to the church. When Jesus had a message he wanted John to deliver, when he's on the Isle of Patmos, it was to the churches. See? This is God's manner. God has something to say to the churches, and here the church, the people are being told that the word is for the world. Like, which one is it that's for the world? Which one is it? You say, well, preach the gospel to every creature. Well, that's true. I'll go with that. But who did, who, did the, who did they preach it to? If you're in the book of Acts, you know. They, they addressed, first of all, religious people. The second most were people that were religious, but were worshiping idols. That's the second people. And we don't have any example of anybody else. Unless it's the governors or something like that. And that's right, that's right. <laughs> All right, now, in the house of Jacob, you got to go in the house now. Amos, you got to go in the house. This is not going to be pleasant. You got to go in the house and tell the people what I'm going to tell you. And it's not going to be a happy message. And I want you to tell them, saith the Lord God. Tell it, that's got to be in there. Saith the Lord God. It, this wasn't a word that he, this wasn't his analysis. Amos wasn't going out, and he probably saw a lot of things, but he wasn't to give his analysis of the situation. He was to tell what God told him to say about these people. Amen. You tell him what thus saith the Lord. He didn't come to tell the people what Moses said. He come to tell them what God said. <laughs> he didn't come to tell them what the previous prophets said. He come to tell them what God said, see? Personal message from God. Here's a perspective that's sorely missing in our day. Is who's the source of the message you're preaching? Yeah, Where'd this message come from? Yeah. The library? The denominational manual? Where did what you're preaching come from? That's a critical matter. Judah. Nothing man says can drown out what God is saying. 
even if he's saying yeah. it through men, nothing other men can say can drown out and overrule what God is saying. That's right. Amen. To begin with, there's if there's not a lively sense of who God is, his word will not be taken seriously. It may be taken as interesting, novel, nice, good, but it won't be taken seriously until people know in their hearts who said this. You tell them the Lord God said it. There's an eternal self-existent one who has all power. Tell him I said it. You know, Jesus once said, why do you call me Lord? Eh, Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I, which I say? Now, see, we should ask people that. If you know any disobedient people, you don't necessarily have to say it with a smile, but you, you say it because you want to inform them of the truth. Tell me, why do you call God Lord, Lord, or Jesus Lord, Lord, and you don't do what he said? You do owe us an explanation for this. And you are going to give an explanation to God for it that will not be satisfactory. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's my Lord. Oh, you better not even say that if you're not doing what he said. That's right. Than to have known it and turned away. That's right. Tell him, let's say it to the Lord. The God of hosts. Hmm. That, that phrase is used quite frequently in Scripture. The God of hosts. Hosts means armies. You know, when John was on the Isle of Patmos, he saw, quote, the armies which were in heaven. <laughs> the armies which were in heaven. Daniel said God does what according to his will among the inhabitants of the earth and the army of heaven. God has armies Amen. that carry out his will. They Armies, there are no earthly armies equal to these armies. I mean, one of God's messengers could wipe out a complete army. These are armies. Can you imagine these armies being let loose on Israel? You tell them. The God of hosts has given this word. When they're sent forth, there's not the slightest chance you can, be, you can resist them. God, that militancy. These are militant, uh -huh. person, heavenly personalities. Yeah. They make war. <laughs> now, here's what I want you to tell that the Lord of hosts said this now. That in that day I'll visit the transgression of Israel upon him. Speaking of as a whole nation, it calls it him. Whole nation. In that day, that's the language of divine appointment, see. And determination. God never acts rashly or impulsively. Everything he does is purposed, designated for a certain time. As you tell him, it's, I've already made the appointment. It's in the calendar already. This is the God's above all and knows all things, so he can do this. He can do this. You know, he, Psalmist said, his way is perfect. See, he, he can do this. He can make appointments like this. His way is perfect. I'm going to visit the transgressions of Israel. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to come and spend a little time with them. That's, that's not what visit means here. Other versions say, I will punish. I will destroy. I'll take vengeance. I'll wreak judgment. I'll make Israel pay, Message Bible says. The word translated visit means to attend to, to muster, to number, to reckon, to visit, to punish, to appoint, to look after, to pay attention to. The idea is I'm going to come and look really close at this. 
I know this is going on. The, whatever God pays attention to, he does something about, yes, whether it's for good or for evil. Uh -huh. He focuses his attention on a suffering saint, he delivers him. Yeah. He focuses his attention on a sick saint, he heals him. Amen. I'm telling you about God now, yeah. see? He focuses his attention on the suffering people, he delivers them. When he focuses on the sinful people, he punishes them. That's the way God is. Yeah, well, again, give it, oh, we can see the mercy of the Lord in that too because we just spoke about this times of ignorance that the Lord winked at. Winked at. He didn't focus his that, attention that was on it. the sinful That's state it. of the people. Amen. So Amen. 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 Yes. Because this is his nature. If he'd have looked at it, yeah, he'd have right. done something about yeah. it. So it was a grace that he winked at it, overlooked it. But of course, those days are over. Yes. Now, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Amen. Now, when you face a sinning person, shout out, repent. Yes. God will take it from there. You can't make him repent. Yeah. But they probably won't give any attention to it if you don't tell them. Just got to repent. The days of God's toleration are over. Yes. It's Acts 17, 31, if you wonder where the text is. Times of ignorance, yes. people sin because they're ignorant. Mm -hmm. Times of ignorance, God winked at, overlooked it. But now, yes. now that sin's been taken away, now that the devil's been destroyed, yeah. Now that every temptation comes with a way of escape, now that there's a reconciliation, yeah. now that principles of powers have been plundered, now all men have got to repent. Yes, amen. Right. Yeah, well, I, I noticed that in our prayers sometimes you'll hear somebody say, they'll say, Lord, look upon them. That's right. You're, you're That's asking right. the Lord's attention to be focused because you want something to be done about That's it. That's it. He, I can look on it. I, but I can't do anything right. about it. God can yeah. change it. This is this is a key key point, yeah. key point. Remember when God uh, came down to see what they were doing at the plain of Shinar? Mm -hmm. They're building a tower, the city. He came down. When he looked upon it, he did something yes, about amen. it. When he came down to see what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll go out and see if it's all together as bad as it said. He did something about it when he got down there. No wonder, the, see, the psalmist knew this. Yeah. If I can get God's eye, I'll get his mercy. Yeah. Amen. This is a godly person now. Yeah. Yeah. To get God's eye, I'll get his mercy. So he said, Psalm 80, verse 14, Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. If I look pretty withered, it's in bad shape. So I almost knew if I could just get God to look at it, Amen. he'll do something about it. So are you uh, down in the dumps, as they say? Yeah. Now, if we could help you, we'll do it. But I can tell you, if you're a child of God, and you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you are really having a difficult time, you can just get God to look at you. He'll bring you out. That's the way God is. See, we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You got to know this about God. You got to know this about God. You got enemies that heckling you, making it hard for you. You don't, don't avenge them. Just ask, ask God, look. They dig the pit for me, Lord. Look, yeah. look. Yeah. They're making it hard for me, Lord. Look on them. That's all, that's all it'll take. He'll deliver you. All he had to do is look at the Egyptians, and Israel's on their way out. That's, that's the way it was. But I am, uh, here he says, I'm going to look on the transgressions of Israel. Transgression, that's an interesting word. It means contravention or infraction or infringement or trespass or violation. The idea is there was a line of demarcation and they crossed over it. There was a border beyond which they weren't to go and they went through it. They went too far. So I'm going to look where they went too far. I'm going to look where they exceeded what I would tolerate. 
I'm going to look at it. It's when a hindrance that placed there by God is ignored. They just barge through the barricade and go ahead anyway. Why? Because they're rebellious against the Lord. Yeah. See, the, on, the only way you can do this is to be rebellious against the Lord. When the Lord throws up a blockade, it may take a lot of forms, but somehow there are people who want to sin and they can't. It's hard to get it get it get done. Those are blockades. Transgression is when you barge over it and do it anyway. God says, I'm going to visit their, their transgressions. Now, now paydays come. Now paydays come. And when I visit the transgressions, I'm going to visit the altars of Bethel. Now, Jeroboam set up at one time one altar in Bethel and one in Dan, placing a golden calf at each one. And this was his reasoning. 1 Kings 12, 33. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. I said, they were golden calves. That's the same thing Aaron made. That's the same words they said. These be the gods. So how important is it if you try and make religion convenient? Wasn't that what he was doing? Yeah, right. It's too much. It's too long of a trip. Go down there for a few days for the feast of Passover. Yeah, let's, be, let's bring it home. Let's have it right close. Let's have it home here. Yeah. You don't have to travel. It says, I'm going to visit. I'm going to visit the altars. See, they had not only was there an idol, there were altars. She said, in a plural, altars. There apparently is building them more altars. As a matter of fact, Hosea 8, 11, and 10, 1 says they made altars to sin and increased altars. So Bethel wasn't like a little 20-foot circle. They built a lot of altars. I'm going to visit those altars. These altars reflected a religion that was created by men. They represent a false concept of God. God wouldn't worship to these altars. He moved through all the mechanics and that, but God didn't have anything to do with these altars. These altars were made to satisfy men, not God. But from heaven's viewpoint, they were transgressions. Now what was done at them was sinful. Now cut off the horns of the altar, he said. I cut off the horns of the altar. But the horns are what held the sacrifice on. As indicated in Psalm 118, 27. The, altar, the horns, they tied the sacrifice on there and held it on with that. So, in other words, I'm going to make the altars lose their functionality. <laughs> they won't be able to be used anymore. They'll be a, become useless relics. Without the horns, either, not an altar. All right, now let's take a moment with that in mind and view what's happening in our day. Amen. It appears it, that there's a judgment from God of this sort that's going on. Yeah. There have been spiritual altars such as play, been set up places to offer sacrifice to God and they've become empty buildings. And yeah. Large churches are being faced with massive debt, mm -hmm. having to close their doors. One of the, one large mega church from up in Indiana. We are from Munster, Indiana. Steve Muncy's the preacher's name I personally knew, and he was administrator of a school that Michael went to at one time. Large church, biggest building in the town of Munster, Indiana, shut down. These are all over the place. These are happening. The only ones that aren't are the ones that accommodate the will of the people. Some buildings now they're used for community service. They said it was built for God. That's what they said. Mm, this is the Lord's house. That's what they said. Now they got Boy Scouts are there. Athletic teams are there. Voting privileges are there. What is that? 
The functionality has been taken away. God's taken the horns off the altar. That's what it is, brother. Plain and simple. Yes. There was a, a similar thing said said through Jeremiah. Jeremiah was told to go to the temple and prophesy. And he was supposed to say, he said, don't say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Yes. That's right. In other words, they were yeah, that's the people right. were thinking that if we keep the religion going, yes. then God yeah. will bless us and he won't yes. he won't harm us. Mm -hmm. But their their religion didn't work. The whole the whole point of the sacrifice, if you remember, was was to was to uh, to turn away the wrath. Of That's us. right, Amen. And here Amos is saying, yes. you can offer as many sacrifices as you want. The wrath is still coming. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is like a it's like a useless religion. It can't it can't it can't do anything at all. But the people were still. Taking like t trying to take shelter in it. That's right. Yeah. Instead of instead of really right. instead of really dealing with God yeah. and re and repenting, or as Amos will say later, he said he said let, let righteousness flow like rivers. He yeah. said just do what's right, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't yeah. do it. Instead, they just they kept it this It's like they were playing a game. Yeah. That's right. With religion. That's right. <laughs> it didn't work at all. I think. You've got the similar situation today. Here you've got a church, quote, a church. This church says it believes in God, believes in Christ, who has all power in heaven and earth. And they have a counseling staff in the church. <laughs> Isn't one of Jesus' names wonderful counselor? Amen. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit is? A counselor, a comforter? Amen. What they're saying is our church doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. Our religion doesn't work. Uh -huh. But we're borrowed this body of knowledge from the world and we can kind of try and talk you out of your trouble. Is it serious? Oh, it's more serious than dare, dare a man to imagine. It's an, it's an altar in Bethel. That's what it is. Amen. And surely as the, author, as the altars of Bethel were under the curse of God, so is all human effort to substitute yes. something else for God. Amen. It's an exercise in futility. All right, let's see what else he has to say. I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. <laughs> sounds kind of like an opulent society. You see, if you, even if you don't know what it means, it kind of sounds like they were doing pretty well. I'll smite the winter house. Other versions say the winter mansions. The winter house was uh, apparently a luxurious dwelling for the winter time were more safety was afforded and warmth. You remember the time that Jeremiah's book was read to the king and Jehudi was there. He didn't like what was written so he cut yeah. cut the page out of the book. Here's where it was read. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. See that gives you an idea of the winter house. It was uh, adapted for the yeah. for the climate. Some people think this is a part of a larger house, but I, th I think it's just exactly what it says here. Yeah, it was a sign of considerable wealth which had been accumulated in the name of religion. Remember how he said you rob the poor and sell, sell the poor, and take their pledge, take their whatever they pledge and make it your own, remember? So the, these houses were built with religious wealth. And with the summer house. Uh, summer house, that was different. That was accommodating for the summer. When Ehud, who was a deliverer sent from God, Judges 3.15 says, came to Eglon. That's the one he said I, he stabbed him and went up to the hilt, the knife. Went to the house of Eglon. 
it says he was sitting in his summer parlor. Yeah, the NIV says his summer mansion. As he was sitting. See, summer house, winter house. So we're so wealthy, we can, we can actually build a house for the season. Yes, I'm going to judge both of them, both house, summer and winter houses. And I'm going to judge the houses of ivory. Houses of ivory. It, that's a pretty opulent house. Sometimes you'll see pictures of some of these palaces that modern-day dignitaries in foreign countries have. There's a lot of marble and ivory, and it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Houses. You know, Ahab built a house of ivory. Scripture says, 1 Kings 22, 39, an ivory house. It's generally agreed that this ivory came from the tusks of elephants. Solomon had a throne of ivory overlaid with, quote, the best gold. Matter of fact, he had a fleet of ships that brought ivory in. A navy. The chief musician in Psalm 45, 8 wrote about ivory palaces. Remember, we take a song out of the ivory palaces. The Asherites made benches of ivory, but we understand benches to be planks. Their floors are made of ivory, is the idea. And later, Amos will refer to beds of ivory. See, so they, this was a luxurious, in the name of the Lord now. This was the, in the name of the Lord, all this was accumulated. Though in Israel, while they were provoking the Lord to anger, anger with their devious ways, they were paying very close attention to themselves. While they are withholding from God, they were giving to themselves in an abundant way. And they probably could say, well, God's really blessed us. I mean, how could God be against us? I mean, think of it. We got winter houses. We got summer houses. Huh? Think of it. Some of our leaders have ivory houses. Sure, God is sure blessing us. I mean, think of the ministry we got. Think of the, we got 30 satellites we reach around the world. God's really blessed us. We got seven houses. As if your name's Oral Roberts. We got seven houses, not bungalows. Now I say not bungalows from religion. Great houses, great houses. I'll do the great houses too. Some versions say the many houses or many rooms. I think he's talking. He's not talking about a count of the houses. He's talking about the great palaces and mansions that the people, some of the people had. I'm going to uh, come against them. Now, some of the translators, they've, they're not agreed on what this means. I'll give you what the, they say. They give us uh, five, five different renderings: mansions, many houses, many rooms, many other houses, added houses. That's what they say. So I, I just like great houses. Yeah. Great meaning not quantity, but nature of the houses. Luxury. Now this is a, a judgment against Israel. Does what you have make a difference? I would say yes, it does make a difference. This is all stuff they had. Yeah. Hmm? That they, they would claim came from God. God was judged against it. Human greatness and achievement will count for nothing. The house may be great, the service may be a lot, they're not gonna, may have a big wall around it, not gonna, they may have a safety, they may have a safety system. I'm gonna go against the houses. It was much like the uh, way he spoke to Edom and Edom's response, remember? Edom, he judged Edom, and they said, we are impoverished. <laughs> but we will return and build the desolate places. Yeah. We can do it. We can, come on, folk, we can do it. Let's build it again. We can do it. That's what they were saying. That's right. yeah. God said, they shall build, but I will throw down. 
They shall call them the border of wickedness of the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. So you, everything you build, I'm going to knock down, and pretty soon the people are going to know, hey, God's against these people. Yeah. Yeah. Now, candidly, I think this is going to happen in the religious world. I think the whole world's going to see, hey, this is just a lot of malarkey. Ha, yeah. huh, this wasn't even real. Look at because when God pulls out, it's because the people weren't his. And they weren't engaged with him at all. And if people think God isn't going to pull out, think about Israel. See, there I mentioned they've been raised up to show you how God thinks. If, they, if people think they can maintain a church in which God is not obviously resident and where God's will is not being done and where the people don't understand God and if anyone thinks you can maintain that, they are just wrong. Yeah. Amen. They are not right. God at some time going to close the doors yeah. and I think he started. Yeah. That's my opinion. When people are living in contradiction of the nature of and the revealed will of God, they must be apprised of the situation. Somebody's got to speak up and say this. This stuff you're doing, this is not of God. As a general rule, this isn't done. But the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. It's the church's job to keep the truth out in the limelight. Amen. Amen. So no one has to say, "What is? does the Bible say anything about that? Well, everybody knows. This is particularly true of those that are identified with Christ. Our text emphasizes the ministry of the prophets in this regard. They pointed out the sins of the people. John the Baptist came. He pointed out sins of the people. Jesus came. He pointed out the sins of the people. When Jesus had a word to deliver to the churches of Asia... For the defective churches, he pointed out their sins. The apostles, when they wrote churches that were deficient, they pointed out where they exactly where they were deficient and what they should do about it. He, deficiency doesn't just naturally go away. Spiritual life doesn't heal itself. It doesn't. Somebody had there has to be divine intervention. There has to be a grain of repentance and there has to be a lot of activity take place before a person can recover Amen. from the snare of the devil. Yeah. <laughs> so in Amos, you remember when Jesus came, he, he delivered diatribes against the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers, those that love chief seats. He sp Publicly, yeah. he spoke about it. In Amos, we're being exposed to the unchanging God. Yeah. He already told you that this, this is not just judgment against Israel. He, he announced five other judgments against nations outside Israel. To let Israel know, hey, wherever sin's found, you're tampering with my ignorance, with my anger. Yeah. You're, you're, tamp you're tampering with my indignation. When you, wherever sin's found, it doesn't make any difference if it's found, found in Babylon or if it's found in the church. Yeah. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar gets it too, yeah. right? Yeah. Now in Christ Jesus, we're admonished to recall of God's dealings with Israel. Think back about it now. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12 is one passage. He, he cites, he traces the history of Israel and says, don't be murmurers like they were. Don't. Huh? Yeah. Don't be murmuring like they did. Don't be fornicators like they were. Harden not your heart like they did. Two times in the book of Hebrews he says, Harden not your heart is in the day of provocation. That was a time when they pushed over the edge. God said, you tempted me this ten times. This is it. Don't, provoke, don't be provoking God. He's long-suffering, but not forever. When Israel provoked God and suffered for it, we, we must learn. There's some things God has told us. There's some things God expects out of us. And when God expects something from you and it's not there, don't you dare give him an excuse. Don't try and explain it to us. 
We got our own. We got our own things. We got to pay attention to. We got time to listen to somebody else explaining why they're deficient in front of God. God well, we're working out our own salvation. It's fair and terrible. You got to work it out. Amen. You have to do it. You have to work it. And if you don't, Amos. That's what Israel. They fail to work it out. David was an Israelite, but he worked it out. Amen. Yeah, he worked it out. Prophets were Israelites. They worked it out. John the Baptist was an Israelite. He worked it out. Zacharias and Elizabeth were Israelites. They worked it out. Mary and Joseph were Israelites. They worked it out. See, they took it seriously, and they got the strength to do what they could do. So, I know you take, you take this word seriously. We just need to encourage one another to keep on taking it seriously. You, you can get used to hearing some of this. Like, if you hear a lot of uh, judgment talk, you can get used to it. And some of them might say, well, I feel like I haven't been to church unless my toe has been stepped on. You ever heard they used to say that when I was a boy. You hear that people say this a lot. See, you can get used to judgmental talk, but you, you don't want to get used to it. You want to, as soon as you hear it, and it, as soon as you say, well, this is talking to me, right then and right there, make an about face, repent, God will take you back, and you'll have, you'll have done with being overcome in that area. And you'll have to fight the good fight of faith. That's, just, that's how you react. And sometimes during a meeting, or sometimes while you're praying, or sometimes you're reading the scripture, or you're listening to something, it, you, something about your life will be, there it is, it just comes to you, and you see, this has got to go. When you have a moment like that, that's the, ti that's the time to deal with it. Don't put it on a shelf. That's the time to deal with it. And if you do, you won't have the Amos experience. Yeah, amen. That's the truth. Now you won't have the Amos experience. Amen. All right, I think I'll close there. Yeah, Sister Barb. The point about the importance of telling where the word came from, that it was from God. And I was considering some of the sensitive souls in the scripture when they knew the word came from the Lord, their response to that. Yes. A lot of them were, it's the word of the Lord. Let him do what seemeth right. Amen. Or be it unto me, as he has said. Amen. Even here in our midst, um, we've had causes or occasions where there's been some contentions kind of stirring. But when the word of the Lord was spoken and it was said, this is what God said, it quiets Amen. those things and it causes, causes Good. peace to reign. Good. Um, Good. Amen. Amen. Yes. said and understand it then we need, we need to testify then other people will hear it and they can testify <laughs> that's good yes a few times in the lesson that I'm commenting on the fact that God doesn't change but you know this this is not only is this to be a sober thing for people who are living wickedly this is quite a quite a blessing for yes. those who are keeping the faith Amen. because he's not gonna he's not gonna uh, forget your labor not of love. Unrighteous to he's not going to do it because yes. he doesn't change. So if he's told you to walk in the spirit and you won't satisfy the lust of, you walk in the spirit because you know then you yes. have God's word, you won't Amen. satisfy the lust of the flesh. Amen. Mm. Yes, Brother Jason. This, uh, this word about the winter summer houses seems to be a indicates, generally speaking, some kind of economic judgment That's right. where God is, God is taking away material That's wealth. Right. It seems to me, and I think this is why these prophetic examples are in Scripture, it seems to me that if we, if we look around, we, we can see this very example being That's worked right. out. If, That's you, right. if you know what's going on in the world right now, all, almost all of the Western world right now has been in a recession. It's actually worse in Europe than it is here in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I can't help but think that this that God is, is somehow executing judgment yeah, right, on, right. on nations, just like Israel was a nation. That's right. Yeah. Sometimes his judgments, he takes wealth away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, because people trust in wealth, see, and yeah. and when a lot of times when when nations are prosperous, they get carnal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a, this provokes God. You can mm -hmm. you can trace this through history, even in our own nation. Wealth mm -hmm. tends to make flesh like prominent. That's right. And it provokes God. That's right. Right after the First World War, there was a, a decade called the Roaring Twenties, mm -hmm. which was followed by the Great Depression. That's mm -hmm. right. You can just kind of trace this through. No, I think you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, he. he the judgments he had against those five nations before there was an economic nature to them. He does their palaces and so forth, yeah. Their opulence. If well, Actually, it's a mercy. If wealth is leading you astray, it's a mercy that he takes it away. Amen. Maybe you've experienced this in your life. That when you got more than you could use, you had to wrestle with a new kind of temptation. Because they that would be rich, you know, fall into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Well, the thing about it, the point that you made of the people misassessing their prosperity and their wealth as being an evidence of God's, mm. it, it actually could be. But the point is, is that it wasn't in their case. That's right. And when when prosperity is a, a direct uh, benefit and blessing from the Lord, then it it's it's. It, it's, it will be accompanied by an opportunity to use that yeah. right. for, the, for the advantage of, yeah, of his right. people in some way. But that, that same liability exists in deciphering all kinds of experiences of life. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could have uh, one person that says, oh, they're, they're suffering that because God's unhappy with them. But it could actually be they're suffering something that that is that's a result of, of their, their growing in faith. Mm -hmm. But it could... Yes, but the, the point is, is that yeah. life is only uh, correctly deciphered by drawing close to the Lord. Mm. Mm. Very good. Say mm. it again. The, the various it? experiences of life can only be deciphered by being close to the Lord. Whether mm. yes. it, things can be, uh, when they're judged by appearance, mm. can be judged, assessed just exactly wrong. Yeah. Because they're... I think people are too simple. I think if it's if it appears to be good, it must be from God. If yeah. it appears to be evil, it must be from the devil. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You want you want to learn how to be abased. Yeah, that's right. I know how to abound. Yeah. I've tasted of that. I know how to be abased. I've tasted of that. Yeah. They sometimes aren't always. It doesn't always go from a based to a bound. It always goes from a bound to a based. But you have to learn to live. Yeah, don't think if I could only have this, if I could only have that, then I'll be okay. May not be true. All right, we'll have a closing word of prayer. Do you have any father? We're grateful for these accounts you've left in Scripture so that we will not... We, we do not have to be ignorant in this matter. We ask for grace, Father, to live godly, soberly, and uprightly in this present generation. We ask for eyes to see when you're working, hearts tender, to respond immediately when you have convicted us of sin, and to rejoice immediately when you have shown us progress we've made in the faith. We commit ourselves to is to a faithful creator in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.